Let's take an airplane to that western part of our own country called for many years the Great American Desert. Although we think of our land as rich and fertile, 20% of it is desert. On and on the great ship flies, the miles falling behind by the minute. Now we are passing over high mountains. For the most part of this country lies between high mountains on both the east and the west. In the absence of trees and grass, the rocky landmarks stand out in striking fashion. This is Ship's Rock, on whose summit, so Indian legend says, the ark grounded at the end of the great flood. Here is a community house where live a score of Pueblo families, where a dance is put on for our benefit. The Pueblos are the most advanced of American Indians, for somehow early civilization the world over seemed to thrive near desert regions. Come on, baby, smile for us. Northward are the sagebrush lands of Oregon and the Vail Reclamation Project. Here our government has dug broad canals over the desert land. A great dam is built to impound the water so that it may be stored for use as wanted. At the river, a diversion dam is built to turn the water into this reservoir. From this artificial lake, the water is carried out to the thirsty land in great main canals. Water can be poured into concrete pipes and siphoned over hills. By its side, in an open ditch, flows free water for the nearby land. Where the land is to be cultivated, the water is spread into small parallel trenches so that it may moisten the entire area. Then the plow turns over the fertile soil. Strangely enough, some of the richest land in the world is in the desert. The drag finishes the planting process and we are ready to let nature take her course. Here is a field of potatoes ready for harvesting. Now the harvester is digging them out of the ground, ready for market. This is a field of onions. Notice how close together the ditches run, for they need lots of water. And here is a crop of great big Bermudas being gathered and topped. At the grater, they are sorted as to size and then are sacked. This farmer is cutting a field of alfalfa hay, the perfect food for hogs and dairy stock. And here is the barn, the haystack, and the home of a settler on what was so few years ago a part of the great American desert.
here's a barnyard full of little pigs thriving on such feed as alfalfa. And this herd of Holstein cows coming home at milking time is a moneymaker, for alfalfa is one perfectly balanced dairy food. Beef stock is driven in from the surrounding mountain ranges to be fattened in this irrigated district. while enormous herds of sheep are easily handled. This is the town of Harper, sprung up almost overnight in this sagebrush land, proud of its school and its high standards of education. And here is the finest and most important crop grown. Leaving the Vale project where man is gradually reclaiming through water a small part of our useless lands, we move into a far country to see an old civilization built in the desert. We cross the ocean to Africa, to the valley of the Nile, and see how the ancient Egyptians used a great river to reclaim one of the driest lands on earth, and built a rich and mighty empire. To this very day, the peasants still lift the waters from the river, in just the same way they did eight centuries ago. method was brought to Egypt by the Romans before the days of Christ. primitive plow is exactly like the ones pictured in the tombs and in the writings of the earliest Egyptians. On the banks of the river to this day, the potter works his clay, just as did the ancients. When it is of the right consistency, he puts it on his simple wheel, turned by foot power, and shapes it with skillful hands. When it has assumed the desired form, he adds handles and then cuts it off with a coarse twine. It is now ready for baking in the outdoor kilns, and since Egyptian pottery is not glazed, this is a simple process. Not far from the Nile stand the pyramids built by Egyptian kings many centuries ago as their tombs and memorials. The Great Pyramid is so large that the capital at Washington could be set inside with room to spare. Its sides that look so rough were once faced with smooth and glistening white limestone, inlaid with inscriptions of solid gold. But robbers have stolen the gold many years ago and builders have made whole cities from the limestone. This opening, originally hidden against thieves, leads to the tomb inside. 
This is the Sphinx, a guardian figure carved out of a single ledge of sandstone. A secret passageway once joined the Sphinx with the pyramid. Mingled with the ruins of the past, the Moslem minarets suggest the romance of Arabian nights rising on the glories of a mighty fallen empire. Through devious and little used ways, we find our way out into what was once the pleasure gardens of a pharaoh. This colossal statue lying on the ground is a gigantic figure of Ramesses. Southward at the ruined city of Thebes, we see remains of similar figures, which were used as columns to an old temple. Nearby is another temple penetrating deep into the hills. Still unharmed by the sandstorms of the desert, sit the overtowering colossi of Memnon. And here is a dance of the women. You will note how in their skirts they sport the evidence of their handiwork. As in so many Negro dances, there's lots of motion, but very little progress. And these white shells, which the girls wear, are quarry shells, the only money used in a great part of Africa. Here is a fantastic dance where men imitate birds. Out on the edge of the village, the natives have discovered a great ant hill and are busily engaged in digging into its underground storehouse. And now they are robbing it of the kernels of grain that the ants have so carefully stored away. This is the Toreg method of shaking hands. It looks almost as if they were searching strangers for concealed weapons. Proper, let us study its animal life. Yes, these are the same storks which spend the summers on the housetops of Germany and Holland. With their strong wings, they skirt the Great Sahara Desert to its southern rim and spend the winter in its sunshine. And here, lined along the top of the village wall, are those ugly but useful birds, the vultures. They feed upon decaying flesh and act as the scavengers of the native villages. This palm tree is full of crows and they too help the vultures. And here is a desert water hole to which gather from far and near all manner of desert birds and beasts. This is a flock of locusts, a type of grasshopper, which in a few hours can eat a country clean of all living green things. These are the desert doves, strong and fleet of wing as all desert birds must be. And they too join the throng at the water hole, where a young deer comes to keep them company. Over there is a spotted hyena, one of the most unlovely and treacherous animals of the desert. And here is a desert fox digging into the hole of a desert rat. 
now he's got him. And off he goes to a sheltered valley where he can enjoy his prey in peace. And after dinner, a nice big drink at the water hole. And so home to bed. And here in a little cave in the rocks, we hear the mewing of some baby animals. A native answers their call and brings out two wild cat kittens. On the rock above are guinea hens. These are choice eating for the natives. And we watch a group of hungry hunters as they stalk a lone fowl. And now we come to the camels, the most useful of all desert animals. They furnish milk, hair for cloth, leather, meat, and transportation. Their long necks easily reach up into the trees for foliage, and their varied temperaments are revealed in their faces. Supercilious, nonchalant, sophisticated, and humorous. And now with camels, we prepare to leave the last settled village and to go out onto the waste places of the desert proper. The camels are fed, packed, and watered, for one drink will last them if need be for as many as four days. The caravan gets underway, for in the desert, they always travel in company for safety. Two days out, we reach the last water hole. There will not be another for 300 miles, we dismount. Fill our water bags, water our camels, and soon we'll be on our way again. The large padded hoofs of the camel are well suited for traveling over the soft desert sand. 